Hello everyone and welcome back to Lawrence Plays for another Factorio Space Exploration Crastorio 2 update. And this time we are starting out on Talos once again because I've been expanding over here. And the first and most impressive part, I think, of the expansion is up here in uh, in Talorbit, in up, up up above Talos, where I've been expanding out and, and generate and building up some more of the um, more more solar area, and more importantly. We've had another visit from the Misfortune, which has dropped off enough pieces of space elevator cable that I've now been able to finish off this space elevator. And that's ma that's in that's very, very important. That's big news, because that means now we can get all of the all of this solar solar array up here is now being used in order to send power down to Talos. And if we have a look on here, you can see that we're producing we're now generating about what are we what are we generating? We're generating almost 500 megawatts. Virtually all of which is being sent straight down the elevator cable down to down to Talos in order to power the systems down there. And if we look back over time a bit, you can see these up and down spikes, and this, these will correspond with the day and night cycles down on Talos, uh, because in, 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 at night you can see we're um, we're sending down about a gigawatt, but there are still a load of solar panels down there on the planet that are generating a certain amount of power and keeping it right and and allowing us to have this sort of bit of an offset here. Now, in theory, I should probably pull up all of those solar panels and bring them up into space, probably in a space train, and deploy them up here because they'll generate several times as much power. But at the moment, I haven't actually bothered with that because it doesn't it doesn't feel vital because at the moment things are working. We've got a, we've got three times the amount of power. Well, we've got almost twice the amount of power being generated up here that we're using. So I think things are basically okay. At the other end of the elevator, well, there's a little loop of uh, space rail down here, but I haven't done much more with that. And I've realised, actually, as I've been working on this, that I've made a bit of a mistake here. Um, because there isn't all that much space available around the spaceport facility down here. And I, and I was initially thinking, well, that'll be fine. I'll just put in a station along here that fills up, that puts all of this beryllium that's being being made here straight into a, into a space train. It can be taken up into space and put into a spaceship to be passed off to to Norbit and anywhere else that ends up needing beryllium. Um, but then, since then, it's occurred to me that actually I'm going to need to have many stations down here. There's going to need to be one for taking the beryllium up, one for taking all the miscellaneous junk and overspill and stuff that we're all currently shipping out by delivery cannon over here. So that's all of the excess sand, the excess copper, the excess iron, all of this sort of stuff needs to be shipped out somehow. And when we stop using delivery cannons, there's going to be a lot more of it because we're not going to be turning a load of it into delivery cannon capsules. So we'll be getting rid of quite a lot of this facility around here, um, and therefore won't be able to. And therefore, we'll have even more of the um, the, the coarse rat fragments, for example, coming through here. So there's going to need to be another station to pick up the um, to pick up the, that sort of junk. That's going to be coming across about here, probably. As well as that, we're going to need another two stations for bringing in the cryonite and the. Uh, and the vulcanite that's turned into pyroflux in order to keep all of the all, in order to allow us to do the processing down here. So that's going to mean we're going to need at least four stations down here. And I mean this might be possible. Depending on the sort of size of trains we use. I mean and we might be able to say maybe that's close enough for the next one. And the next one. Okay, we might be able to fit them all in here reasonably sensibly with this sort of area with this sort of space. But there are a couple of options that had occurred to me. One is that if we're going to be getting rid of all of this stuff because we won't need delivery cannons anymore, then all of this space over here could be used for stations, which would be fine. That would would help. We can also move these um, meteor defense cannons up into orbit because in in the new versions of space exploration, if you have the meteor defense and the umbrella defense can be either on the planet or in orbit. It doesn't matter. They'll be able to defend just as well either way. So moving the, these could be moved out, and that gives me a little bit of extra space. And also, I've removed the uh, the free power facility that was in here, the one that was turning wood into biomethanol and then turning that into electricity. Uh, this is partly an attempt to save UPS, but also um, just because it wasn't scaling well enough. So there's loads and loads of space up here, but that's a long way away from this uh, from the elevator here. And I don't want to move the elevator because it's already sort of placed at both ends, and I've pumped in all of the cables to get it finished. So I don't really want to move it. But in theory, I could move this module of production that's making the um, the beryllium here. This could be moved up to being over here somewhere. And then if I needed a third one, it could go in here and, and so on. So there are ways around it. But I think actually having just put these in, I think we're probably we're probably going to be all right. I'll be able to fit in all the stations I need and, and, then, and, and get it all arranged up here. So the way I'll do this is by having... Um, a station, sort of a normal station bit along here with the, with the, with the well with the with the station, and then loaders to up to pull all the stuff out of the trains, 
and then dump it straight into a warehouse. It will probably be off on the end of it. And a warehouse isn't isn't that big. I, this there is actually enough room for a warehouse to be put in along here somewhere, and then however many belts coming off on the other side of it. So I think yes, we're going to have it's, it's going to be easy to fit it fit in the train system along here. That's going to just work pretty nicely and allow us to transport everything up. Pulling out the old free power system did then require a certain amount of fixing to be done. So having having had some infrastructure in the middle here, which I destroyed, meant that I I, uh, I took out all of the uh, pylons as well, which is probably a mistake. I should have used a um, a smarter deconstruction planner that wouldn't have done that. So I've needed to do a bit of linking power back in, which is why there's some of these um, advanced. Uh, pylon substations over here also needs to link link the water back in again because previously for the part of the free power we had a massive duct coming from down here yeah these these ducts here previously went up here to provide the free power system with lots and lots of water and I was also able to tap off that for the um, for cleaning the uh, filters over here and for um, providing water over here for where it's needed so I'd, I've ended up basically I've ended up just replacing those with normal small pipes just because there's there was no need for the uh, for the massive ducts because we just weren't using that much that much water in any of these so I've downgraded to small pipes if if I ever feel it's necessary I can upgrade this back up to uh, using the ducting again because all of the infrastructure is still in down here I haven't demolished that but at the moment it doesn't seem necessary if we look at this pipe it's 99% full we're, we're okay there this also caused a bit of a screw up where the filters weren't being dealt with as, as they should have been. So I've um, we've, we've ended up with a bit of a backlog in here. But as you can see, these, these numbers here do seem to be going down. I think we are um, we are cleaning them faster than we're uh, dirtying them over here. So this again seems to be all right. Another thing that's happened with with demolishing the free power is that I've generated an enormous quantity of um, of wood. So as you can see, there's now 23,000 of it in the logistics system, which is a bit ridiculous. So. Over here, we've got some of it being pulled out of the logistics system by a blue chest. It's feeding it into a, it, it turning it into a processed fuel to feed the train, and I feel that this fuel is it's not particularly amazing, but it gives us a decent amount of acceleration, a decent, a good enough top speed. These trains can bimble around the the, uh, the the area well enough, and we get a bit more fuel out for turning it into processed fuel. So it's better. We're better off running the trains on processed fuel than wood, both because they'll go faster, and they uh, and it uses the wood up more slowly because this just boosts everything by about. I don't know, 50%, 10%, oh, 10%, there we go, and improves vehicle acceleration. So it's very worth doing, but it's not. It, but it still allows us to run off the 23,000 essentially free, free wood that we've got. I have the same thing going on over here, where again it's being brought over by Logistics Bot, which I do feel a bit dirty about, and, and we'll probably fix this in the next stream, so we just have a belt coming up here. That's then being brought over, and again being turned into processed fuel, but not quickly enough. I mean, we well, we are... We're fueling up that train, and down here we are we are putting it into this train. There's there's a bit of a shortage though, so yeah. In order to get the throughput we need here, I think upgrading this to a belt and finding some quicker way to get it out of all of the um out of the chests of shame down here. Well, there's four thousand six hundred in here. Um, I might do a little bit of manual sorting and just put it all into a warehouse. Uh, and since wood stacks up to a hundred, as you can see here, and a warehouse is five hundred stacks, that would mean fifty thousand. So that would be enough to, to put all of the all of the wood that's in the logistics system into a single warehouse, and it can then be it can then be sh shared out as required. I'll probably then put in some additional greenhouses in order to make sure we're growing the wood as fast as we need in order to, to keep the whole system up here satisfied. But that's a, um, a for the future. I think we're, we've got 23,000 to churn through at the moment, so that's that's not, not vital right now. I sorted out the water and pyroflux and acid issues we're having over here, so now we have all of this is running merrily. As you may have noticed, this, this belt here has more or less stopped. Um, because, and that's because we finally managed to get enough beryllium over to Norvis, uh, where we're making it into the aeroframe scaffolds, that the system can now stop delivering it. So we've, uh, we are actually producing beryllium faster than we're using it, which I think is amazing. It's taken a long time to get to this point. Um, so eventually we will we'll have these, these, this system down here will back up all the way along, along here and stop feeding it through. We've got an additional, I think we've got, we haven't got the priority set up along here. We should actually prioritise this one to input from the left like that. Because that means that we'll take the um, the beryllium that's coming from from this system up here as a priority over this system. And that's a good thing because this is the one that's being built, that's being made from um, the input from the from the core miners, which is, as we've said, discussed before, essentially free, or at least a steady input. Whereas the, this is coming from mines that will eventually run out. We don't seem to have enough parking space for trains here, so that's going to need to be sorted. I've made too many of these and not left enough enough of a stacker, so I need to fix that before it becomes a problem. Because, yes, as you can see along here, we've got to the point where we are now producing the, um, the beryllium fast enough from... 
<clears throat> I was going to say, we are producing the beryllium fast enough from the core mining that nothing else seems to be needing to run. But there's something funny going on down here, because whilst I've got a bit of a priority set down here, these should still be running flat out, and they're not. These should be running flat out, and they're not, because I haven't put in a priority for this chain over this chain yet. So something isn't going right here. Why, why are you not running? You're not running because you're full on the output. You're not running because you're full on the output. You're not running because you're full of water. I thought I fixed this problem. I did kind of fix the problem, but it's still being a problem. There's still full water all the way down here. And this tank is full. That should not happen. There should be a system here to make sure that this tank never gets filled up to 100%. What's going, what's, what's going on? There's a, a non-existent pipe going up. A pipe to nowhere up here. Maybe that was an overflow before. Um, because there's supposed to be a system here where we fill this up gradually. Maybe I've screwed this up when I was rebuilding the things. Um, there's supposed to be a system that fills this up gradually with water as required. That doesn't go anywhere. Let's get rid of that one. Welcome to Lawrence attempts to work out why everything is broken. This may take a, then it may take a moment. Right. So the complex part of this system is that we are produ both producing and requiring water. So down here we are we are we are producing water from this step. We require water for this step. And um, is that it? Yes, that appears to be it. So we've got. So what we need, what I need to do then, it looks like, is have this this overflow here needs to go somewhere, and presumably that was previously pumping into the free power system and just dumping it into making trees, and now we're not doing that. So I need to I need to do something with with all the water in here and get it to go just somewhere else. So for now, I should dump what's in the storage tank, and that'll make the things work again. But next, the next thing to do will be to take the water from here and feed it into everything else that uses water as the priority and then use this to top it up as required. So that's going to make things a little bit more complicated, but it looks like this is a net producer of water, which is a little bit unfortunate. Worst case, I can just put a, a flare stack on here and blow the water off into the atmosphere, and to be honest, that might be easier, I might be lazy and just do that. But at the moment, um, we, we've got... At the moment, I, I fixed it temporarily, and we are produ now producing the beryllium at the rate we're supposed to be, I think. Yes, you can see it's all flowing in down here. And down here as well. Okay, good. So th things are now are now running as as uh, run, running as they should. So um, that has derailed my train of thought somewhat, however, because I was talking about something else. Yes. So the plan is, in the long run, uh, we've already got the prioritisation down here. That means this will be used as a lower priority compared to this area. I need to put in something as well that will block maybe these outputs, or maybe more likely I'll put in a pump in here that tells this bit not to pump the uh, molten beryllium through if there is more than a certain amount probably in this chest down here and that will mean that if we have loads and loads of beryllium and we're just trickling through it we'll carry on making the uh, supply just from just from what's coming in from the core mining but if we're ever a bit shorter of it then the whole system can kick in and we can produce it much more quickly and, and, and get, get all the buffers filled up and make sure we have a good supply of it coming through. And that's going to be much more efficient in for how, how we how we like to keep things running around here. I think that's going to be quite a good way to do all of this. So we'll uh, we'll get that built up in the in the next in the next stream, and then we'll have a uh, more efficient and just generally nicer um, way of producing the beryllium. So you noticed you sort of saw earlier how I had all those trains stacked up here, and yes, that is a problem which I will need to fix. But that the reason we've got more trains running now is in order to keep when we when all of this system is running flat out, we needed significantly more barrel ore to be coming in. And so in order to get that, I've put in an, a couple of additional barrel mines. There's one up here, and these are just cop straight up copies of the previous um, outpost I was using to, for, for, for the mining. So if you look at this, we have a perimeter wall around the outside with lasers and pollution scrubbers that will keep the area clean and safe from biters. Then we have mining drills over all of the uh, barrel mines in there. They all feed into a, into a warehouse. A train can come along here when there's enough. I think it's 6,000 is the amount I watch for in the warehouse. Um, and then the, the train will come along, grab all that barrel and take it off to be processed. We also have a filter train that will bring up clean filters to here and unload them into the um, into the system. It will also pick up the dirty filters when they're available. Um, I'm not sure why the dirty filters aren't being picked up. Oh, there they go. They are being picked up. Just um, the, the, the the inserter was struggling to pri decide what should be a priority. <laughs> um, it seems seems to be okay now, though. Anyway, yes, they all get fed into here, and, and a train rattles backwards and forwards, bringing in clean filters, taking away dirty filters, just to keep the system running nicely. 
I've done exactly the same down here. This is, once again, exactly the same system, but on a slightly larger scale, because it's a slightly larger patch. And so we're feeding out the um, the beryllium here, we've got, and we've got, we've got almost 10,000 in here, so we have, we have a decent supply of beryl available now. Uh, making these outposts was relatively straightforward. I used, as I was discussing last week, I used the nuclear artillery to clear out all of the uh, the biters that were in in the way. So I've I've left these ones because, to be honest, they're far enough away that they're not too much of an issue. But I blew up all the ones in sort of this area. Well, you, you can see the sc scorches from the uh, fr from where I've been playing with the artillery, um, and then I was able to just put in the rail across here and drop in another uh, an another mining facility. There are probably a couple of there, there's a there's a, another core seam there that I could, that's probably good, would be worth going for because it would give me that extra, extra little dribble on the on on the core mining, but in general this whole this area is now basically okay. I've also made the whole area around here safe again with the uh, c combination of artillery and then just flying around using my personal laser defenses to zap any biters that were left behind. And now well, okay, I've left a few worms in here, but there aren't any spawners, so this perimeter is now secure. In theory that means I don't need some of these inner walls especially around here, but I might as well just leave them out of sheer laziness and and, what, and why not. Hopefully the pollution is under control. Let's have a quick look. Um, seems to be reasonably under control. Uh, could perhaps do with a little bit more along the bottom side of here. It seems like there's a bit has been leaching out. The biggest problem is the railways though, because the trains do leach off a little bit of pollution as they trundle around. And that's why we've got these sort of pollution stripes down all, all the rails around here. Uh, the problem is that this, this area, with it being a desert planet, it doesn't really do very much pollution absorption. We get almost none from this sort of terrain. So really, all the pollution absorption that we get comes from the uh, comes from biters growing more biters, which is a little unfortunate. Um, and we did have quite a lot being leached out around here. I have since gone around, and as you can see, this is now being cleaned up properly. If you look around, you, you can see that virtually all the pollution is being cleaned up by the air purifiers around the edge of here. So there's none, es there's all, probably none escaping from from this main base, and I don't think there's any escaping from the outposts either, really. Um, the problem is that just some of it has got out already and is upsetting the biters a little bit. But the vast majority of it is getting dealt with nicely. So I think it's mostly okay. We're going to get a few biter attacks, but it shouldn't be too severe. Over here, I've finally repaired and slightly more defended the uh, the little outpost over here that was doing that's um, where we occasionally produce a little bit of um, iron ore when it's needed. Um, there have been a few attacks on it, but I've, I've, I've made it a little bit tougher. There's a few more lasers in there. To be honest, I probably should have put even more lasers in uh, to make it a little bit more defended, so something like this. But it hasn't been, it hasn't been too, it hasn't had too much of a problem. The, the, the biters have mostly been leaving it alone uh, because the mining isn't really happening, so there's very little pollution being generated here. I do note that there's no, um, uh, no filters being brought over here, so I guess over here... I should be removing the priority on this uh, and, and sending at least some of the filters out that way to be to be um, to be passed around the system again once again. Now, now it's been repaired. And so yes, as we've seen over here, the current oh, I was going to say the current supply of beryllium is more than enough, but no, we we we've, we've pulled a little bit out and uh, and obviously fired it out with the cannon. So it is still being used, um, but we are we have more of it available than we are currently uh, currently using. Let's have a look at the graphs because it's always nice to see how the, how this system is getting on. So we've got we've got a bit of a droop in production here. That was that water problem we had, but now I fixed that. It, it shot back up to the um, to the nice steady state of 343 per minute. Over here we seem to be averaging 233 per minute. So now if we look Look at it over. If we look at production right now, 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 we're absolutely fine compared to the overall sort of amount being used and the amount that's being used right now. So I think we have sorted it. The highest point we've seen over the last long term is up here where it spiked briefly to 578, 632, which is a bit, which is a lot more than we're producing at the moment. But that was quite a brief spike. I'm not sure what caused that. Um, but it was very. We were very briefly using an enormous quantity of it. But at the moment. Things seem to be okay. This 343 per minute, I think, is going to be okay when we seem to be trying to use up. Oh, interesting. Actually, no, I take that back. We are we're using it. We seem to be using it at the same way we're producing it, and almost exactly, which is very surprising. Um, I think we're going to need to let this just run for a bit longer and see how things settle down, uh, because as you can see, we are we are building up a bit of a backlog here, but that backlog did fairly quickly disappear when the cannon started firing again. So, um, who knows? We're going to need to. We, we shall leave once the system. Now the system is running flat out again. We'll keep an eye on it, see how it goes. This leads on to the quite neatly to the next part of the video, where, um, as I was saying, we're going to be bringing all of the resources up for, up and down the uh, the space elevator. And so in Talorbit, we've had the first of our cargo spaceships arrive. And as you can see, this is um, a nice 
big chunky design. It's got two ion engines at the back so it can fly to decent speed. It's got lots of solar panels in it so it can fly reasonably quickly and it's got three warehouses worth of storage in it. And so if we look at this you can see that Mark, who has built the uh, the spaceship system up, has pushed everything right up against the absolute maximums for the um, uh, for storage and and hull stress. So this is the biggest possible ship we can manage at the moment. And so the plan is that we will have the uh, the um, the trains coming up through the elevator here. We'll have a system over here where we can drop off the beryllium, load it into the spaceship. Uh, up here we'll load in uh, we'll load in miscellaneous junk. We'll have an and have another two maybe oh maybe over here who knows for unloading the cryonite and the vulcanite. All of that can then be brought down, up or down in the, in the elevator as required. This ship will then fly off to, well for now to Norbit, but in the future potentially to anywhere, and I believe Mark has done some cunning stuff with the circuitry, which we shall have him ex perhaps have him explain on the stream, or maybe write it all down for me so that I can explain it in another video, where I believe eventually these spaceships are going to be reasonably smart, in, in that they will then, they will hopefully be capable of flying off to anywhere where they are required. I don't believe they are cabled up for that at the moment. But in the future, they might be able to fly off to anywhere that requires beryllium. So that'll be uh, that'll be quite impressive. But for now, it will fly and it will land here in this neat cutout. And this is this is as you can see here. This is the beryllium drop-off for Norbit, uh, Norbit spaceport. So the spaceship will land here. It'll unload the beryllium into these chests. It'll flow up here and go into a a system here which can then bring this off to and load this up into a train so it can be taken off to wherever it's needed. Where it's needed could be on the could be on the, on the space bus over here. It could be for um, Astro science over here. It could be for materials. Uh, it could be for the actual science park up here. I don't think it will be for the science park because I think we're going to do that differently. But it could be for, it could be for those. Or it might come over and go down the elevator at and, and drop off the beryllium at the bottom where we're going to have a beryllium passover system so we can have beryllium available down on Norvis. So the idea is that we will bring in all of the beryllium will come into here by spaceship. We will drop off. 150, no, 1500 stacks of it at a time because three warehouses. That's going to take a long time to fill up. Um, and then from there it can be taken off 100 stacks at a time, so there's going to be potentially 15 trains worth can go from here and go to wherever it's needed. And then once this ship has emptied into these warehouses, it can then buzz off and go off to a different, go back over to um, to, ta to Talos to pick up another load of, of beryllium. So it'll, it'll just shuttle backwards and forwards as required. We've then got more of these over here as necessary, so we'll have one that brings in vulcanite, one that brings in holmium, one that brings in iridium, and so on and so on all the way across here for lots of these. We are also we've also got another couple of spaceships down here. Ah, I see. These are going to be the sort of personal spaceships. So these are the ones where I say, okay, I want to have a spaceship fly out to Talos with a load of stuff in it, so I can build it because I've forgotten to bring some things. I can then use this spaceship and fly it around manually. This one probably won't be mine in the end. Somebody else's name will be written across there, and because they've all got shorter names than me, they're going to be able to fit in a couple of extra solar panels as well. Um, but again, the idea is that these spaceships can fly out as construction ships to wherever they're needed, wherever one of the players needs to do something, and with all of these green chests up here, they can bring out a supply of all of the stuff that's needed. We will also, at some point, probably have similar sort of spaceships to these that will go to other places. Now, whether we'll have, they, they probably won't go from here. So, when um, I over on Talos request a supply of vulcanite, presumably that means that then a ship will depart from Agnea with a huge amount of vulcanite on board and will drop all of that off at Talos and then fly back to Agnea to refill. There's no point in double handling by bringing the vulcanite to Norbit and then flying it on from there. Um, I say there's no point. It would be a slightly simpler way of doing things. However, it would be a bit wasteful with the amount of spaceships fly around, especially for something like cryonite. So cryonite is being produced on Snowdrop in, in, in quite large quantities at the moment. And then if I need it on Talos, it's going to be a lot quicker to bring it round here like that than it would be to bring it from here all the way up to Norvis and then all the way back out to, um, to Talos like that. That would be a much longer flight. There'd be a massive waste of time and fuel. So it makes much more sense to do it somewhat differently. If we did want to have a central handling facility, then perhaps a sensible way to do it would be to put it on Kalidas Asteroid Belt 1, because that's fairly central. We have we have outposts on Talos and Kothar and Snowdrop, and of course Agnea, Norvis, uh, little ones on Tarishkuten and Drakit, but they don't really count, uh, Bigrid and so on. And so at least then you'd be, you'd be flying it out sort of this far, and then, and then you don't, and there'd only be this bit here that's wasted. That said, that said, perhaps Hyperion orbit would be the best place to do it because that's sort of that's a bit closer to Norvis, and that distance is shorter than that distance. Um, but it would mean that uh, a ship going from Snowdrop to Talos essentially would have a bit more of a diversion to do. 
Alternatively, we'll go for the more complicated system, which Mark has been building up on, and I think he's quite enjoying the design process for doing all of that, where where the ships just go literally from A to B. So Snowdrop to, Snow, Snowdrop to Talos wouldn't go via... Hyperion or, or Norvis, it would just go directly from Snowdrop to Talos, and if that ship, and if it was needed on Norvis, the same sh the same ship, and this is the diff impressive part, would go from Snowdrop to, to Norvis and back again. So we're going to try for sort of a little bit of an LTN, or at least a little bit of multi-station multi train functionality. Um, it's probably going to be complicated, but I think it's going to be interesting, so we'll, uh, we'll see what Mark comes up with for that. So as I say, yes, he's designed two types of ship, personal and haulage. He's built up the spaceport around here, which um, a lot of this... What, what's, what's all this stuff? Oh, this is... Ah, I see, yes. This is also bringing in all of the sort of miscellaneous resources that might be needed in, on, out on various different planets. So we'll need a steady supply of train batteries because gradually they get, work, they get destroyed. So you start off with a, a train power pack. That gets, dis that gets used in a train turned into a, a discharged power pack. That discharged power pack can then be recharged in a space train battery pack charging station, and there's a 99% chance it'll be recharged successfully. If it doesn't, then it gets turned into a, di into a destroyed um, power pack, and that you can then you can refurbish it with uh, lithium with some more lithium sulfur batteries and some sulfuric acid. That's going to be annoying because I won't have these, but I will have these. So what we'll probably do with those is stick the destroyed power packs into the junk system and let them be taken back away in the, in in a junk train and then dealt with over here in Norbit. But anyway, that will enter some that they, those can then be turned back into into discharge power packs. But we won't be doing that most of the time. A lot of the time we'll be oh that train is just that ship has just departed. I wonder where that's gone. That was surprising. I was not expecting that ship to go because I don't think it's been configured yet. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll ship the um, the destroyed power packs back to be refurbished. And so that means 1% of the time you're going to need a new battery pack, a new power pack. And so those are being can be loaded onto the train, onto the ship here. And the idea is going to be that we will say, yes, this ship would like to have a certain number of these of the various different things on it. And so we can say that when, when there's a ship here, we would like to have at least a certain number of each of the things that that planet requires. They can be loaded on here by these configured um, inserters, loaded into the into the uh, chest on there, and then the ship will take them away. And then at the other end, they can be unloaded. Now, at the moment, they can only be unloaded by bot, which is a little bit unfortunate. We possibly need to lose one of these solar panels and have another unloader and unloading system over here just to dump the stuff out that's required. But for now, we'll uh, for now it's, 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 a, it's a good start at least. And so that's going to include things like the power packs, also the uh, the space elevator cable, which we're going to be churning through at a non at a reasonable rate, and also we're going to bring out the meteor defense ammunition as well, so we can keep the um, keep everywhere supplied with an appropriate amount of, of of meteor defense ammunition. Because as I said earlier, we can now put those guns up into space and defend the planet from there. It also potentially makes sense to bring the filters out as well for the same reasons the battery packs, because they do gradually get used up, and so. On Talos and a lot of the other planets, we are making them, so we don't necessarily need to have them brought in by spaceship. But if if there's if it turns out that we're making them with something that we don't really have a good supply of, or in for a new outpost, we don't we don't just don't have the things we need for them, or we just don't want to bother, we can bring them in by um, by spaceship as well and just send them down in the train. There may well be more things that will be added to this in time. We'll we'll see how that goes. But at the moment, we have a miscellaneous stuff train that will bring those over to here, dump them into a warehouse, and they can then all be passed over and loaded into the spaceship as we go. As part of all of this, Mark has, of course, had to start making spaceship parts because we're not really making those anywhere. And I don't know where he's done that. So let's have a quick look around and try and find it. Here we go. It's been added to the, 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 the column of doom, or whatever we're calling it these days, because this is where we have basically everything available that we might want to make things. And we've got lots and lots of space. So, up here he is making spaceship flooring and putting it in a red chest. He's making spaceship walls and spaceship doors and, again, red chests. Um, some, oh, I see, that's because the, the walls are required for the doors, so they're being passed up. That's why there's two chests there. Fair enough, that makes perfect sense. Uh, making ion engines and, and rocket engines, technically. Um, but the rocket engines are just being used to make the ion engines, uh, because you need them. Uh, and ion booster tanks and spaceship consoles. Those require, it turns out, those require one of the um, Astro catalogs. So we've got those coming in by by bot, which I'm not a huge fan of, but they're, they're, actually, they're but they're made in small enough quantities. I'm actually okay with that. Having these brought over by bot, I think, yeah, I think I think makes sense. So I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain about that. Uh, spaceship clamps as well need those. And now, and also the Mark II, or the Mark, I don't know what, what Mark to call these. So let's see, we've got the, the basic solar panels that you can't walk on. Then you've got the purple ones that you uh, that are the advanced version. Then you've got the, the blue flat ones. Then you've got the red flat ones. So technically these are tier 4 solar panels. Um, he's pulling in the um, the tier two, tier 3 solar panels here by, um, 
by bot. So this I do not approve of because this is something we're going to be making very large quantities of. So at some point I think we're going to need to either start, well, we need to pull out all of the, we need to get all of these blue solar panels uh, into the system to be upgraded at some point. So that is probably going to end up being done at least partly by bots. But eventually we're going to want to also make the um, the lower tiers of solar panel up here so we can feed them in here to to make the uh, to make the to make to make the red solar panels. Uh, and then whole meme accumulators because we need those for spaceships and also rocket ship bo rocket booster tanks as well which is interesting these rocket booster tanks we don't really have any plans to use at the moment because they use so much rocket fuel and uh, rocket fuel comes from oil which is a limited resource or from massive amounts of space which comes from UPS which is also a limited resource uh, that we reckon we're better off just putting in space elevators on all of the planets and using trains to bring things up and down those and then not having the spaceship land so they don't need they don't need rocket booster tanks they can just use ion stream booster tanks which work from in space so these we probably won't use, but you never know. We may decide we want to have um, spaceships that can land at some point. And it would be quite cool to, to, to establish a, uh, a beachhead on a planet by having a ship that lands, has loads and loads of laser turrets all the way around it, and artillery in the middle of it, and so on and so forth. So it can just land in a relatively... In, in basically in the middle of a hostile planet and just defend itself against all the hordes of biters that are going to come swarming in. Um, I would quite like to build one of those. I was talking about that in my previous stream, uh, in the previous stream when I was playing 0.5 and I never got, I think I sort of put the ship together but never actually used it. And I think that would be quite cool and I want to use one of those at some point but I don't know if I ever actually will get round to it. We shall see. As part of making all of this spaceship stuff. Mark has also discovered he needs aeroframe bulkheads in, in large quantities. So those are being built here by this uh, space, by this um, uh, manufactory here. Now we do need, do we do want to get rid of this at some point because the plan is to move all of the intermediate production down onto Norvis where it can be done much more cheaply because we can use productivity modules. But in the meantime um, this make, having this here makes sense because we don't, we don't have that set up yet. It's a bit sort of in fact, it's not a bit spaghetti in, it's very, very spaghetti in. But, you know, it's working. Um, and it's producing the stuff for our first first batch of spaceships. So, yeah, I'm okay with this. Um, because spaceships, are kind, they're kind of infrastructure, so it's, it's not the end of the world if you're making them in a slightly less efficient way. Because you won't aren't making an, an infinite number of them just steadily going forwards forever. Whereas science packs, you are. So this is okay for, as a time, for the time being. It can, it, it can be there temporarily, and as we all know, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary fix. The thing is, though, this requires massive quantities of immersion plate, and that we didn't, we don't have, as you can see by the fact that it's run out again. And so, if we have a look over on Taras, Mark has also been busy over there expanding production. So um, he's he's discovered that the the limiting factors over here are due to the, the insufficient rare metals and insufficient mineral water. And so he's found another mineral water deposit up here, which he's tapped into. And that's now producing quite a bit more than we than we than we had before. Presumably, uh, it looks like there's a bit of a shortage of pipes here, so it's only it's only running at partial speed at the moment, which might be why uh, these these pipes. Oh no, they, they take it back. The pipes do seem to be pretty full. We do have we seem to have a reasonable amount of mineral water available. Um, ah, we've just got this pump only filling this one up when it's when it's nearly empty, so we can. Uh, yeah, to, to, make, to make sure we use up the, the mineral water that's produced from the core fragment pulverization first. He's also got more uh, rare metals being brought in. That might have required a bit, a bit more of improvement on Norvis to have more uh, d delivery cannons. I'm not sure. But either way, it, there is now a supply of rare metals coming in. And as you can see up here, that is now keeping the um, immersion plate production running... It looks reasonably flat out. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, there, there are green lights on all the, most of the machines. That one's just gone sad. But basically, and that and that one. Uh, the, we, we've now got significantly more immersion plate being produced. And that's keeping things a little bit happier. I have been talking for rather a long time now, though, so I think we're going to call this the end of the episode. So thank you very much for watching. I should be back tomorrow with part two of this episode, uh, where, where we'll talk talk about what other people have been doing and what else has been going on around the around the solar systems. Please check out the, uh, the yeah tomorrow's video. Come back on Monday for the uh, for the stream when we'll be carrying on with solving all the problems I've been talking about. Uh, check out last week last Tuesday's um, video of me driving around in a very pretty part of the UK because I think that's quite an interesting. Uh, it's a very nice video, and I'd like it to get a bit more um, a few more a few more views because it's not. Doing it, it's not doing as well as the Factorio ones do so far. So, uh, yep, I still recommend that one. And then on uh, Wednesday, I'll be back with another uh, another XCOM stream. And on Tuesday, hopefully, we'll have some sort of video coming out. We'll see what that will be. But as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.